Hi everyone, I'm Zach Reinhardt, and today we're doing something a little bit different. We're doing a song analysis. This is something I've been wanting to try out for a while because I quite like watching song analysis videos, but uh, haven't really done one since like high school. <laughs> so we're going to give this a shot. I don't have any degrees in music theory or anything like that, but who cares? Uh, if I'm full of shit, tell me, I guess. And uh, I'm going to try to keep it relatively accessible and simple to like non-musicians, but warning, there is a bit of music theory ahead. So the song we're analyzing today is Dakishime Tai by Happy End. Happy End is a band that you should be familiar with if you are at all familiar with Japanese rock music. They are one of the most important and seminal rock bands in Japanese musical history and really put out some incredible music in the four or five years they were together in the early 70s. And even after the band broke up at the end of 1972, uh, the band's members each went on to have really notable and important and successful careers after the band. Hosono Haruomi went on to form the Yellow Magic Orchestra, which is one of the most important early electronic music groups, period. And also put out some really great solo material. His debut album, Hosono House, I think is really incredible. And Phil Harmony is also a really well-received record of his. Matsumoto Takashi left the spotlight and went on to become a lyricist, for many other artists and is one of the top selling lyricists of all time and in fact last year received a medal of honor from the Japanese government in recognition of his artistic achievements. Sakamoto Shigeru had a solo career for a while and then went on to become one of the most prolific uh, session musicians around, played guitar on just a, a countless number of great records. And Otaki Eichi had a great solo career that and went on to release one of the best uh, pop albums in Japanese history, A Long Vacation. Otaki Eichi is one of my favorite songwriters of all time, and he eventually ended his solo career in the 80s and went on to become a uh, prolific songwriter for other artists. And uh, he is the man who wrote the song we are looking at today, Dakishime Tai. Now, Dakishime Tai is the first song off of Happy End's second album, Kazimachi Roman. This is the album that is widely regarded as Happy End's best and is often regarded as the greatest Japanese rock album of all time. And it's really hard to argue with that stance. It is an album with impeccable production that holds up today even against modern production standards and has uh, really great, tight, slick performances, especially from the rhythm section of Matsumoto Takashi and Hosono Haruomi. Hosono and Otaki Eichi wrote the vast majority of the music on here, and considering they are two of my favorite songwriters of all time, the songwriting on here is wonderful. The songs have this folky rock sound, kind of blurred a little bit with this uh, psychedelic edge to them, and uh, are just really well written. They're all very easy to listen to, easy to get into, they're very accessible, but there's also a lot of depth to them when you really get in and look at the nitty-gritty of what's going on. And that's what we're going to be doing today. And uh, enough hyping it up, let's l dive in to the first song off of uh, what is possibly the greatest Japanese rock album of all time, Dakishime Tai. All right, so welcome to uh, this sheet music that I've made of the intro to Dakishime Tai. I guess before we do anything, why don't we give it a listen? So there are a couple things to notice right off the bat that makes this intro interesting. Um, 
first is that the drums and the bass and the guitar don't really line up entirely well together you know like the bass is playing this thing and it occasionally modifies it by playing this instead um, but it doesn't really line up all that well with what the guitar is doing. It seems like it does it first, but then get the guitar plays this extra little note, and the whole thing is a little off. And then the drums are playing a pretty normal rhythm, but they kind of come in at this weird point after all the other instruments have already started. And the whole thing feels a little bit off until uh, this little boo doo 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 phrase at the end where the whole band lines up and goes into the first verse of the song. This makes this part of the song feel kind of shaky and a little weird, especially when we're introducing strange time signatures like 9-8, when pretty much like 99% of music, at least western music, is done in 4-4. This intro reminds me a little bit of like Captain Beefheart, like, like Frownland or something, which is an incredibly dense and crazy track off of his album uh, Trout Mask Replica. And this is kind of doing a similar thing where all the instruments are kind of doing their own stuff and then line up at some point, um, but taken to the kind of most accessible, easy to listen to degree possible. I think this is a really interesting and cool way to start this song off, and start this album off, really. And uh, it's something that Otaki Eichi has done before and does several times later in his career, and um, is something that I listen for when I'm listening to Otaki Eichi's music, is these kind of rocky, shaky, a little bit rhythmically weird intros that then solidify into something a bit more congealed and kind of comfortable. But after that we drop right into the verse, and I will see you guys over at the piano for that. Alright, so uh, here we are at the piano, and uh, we're going to go over some of the chords of this song, some of the harmony of it. So then we get into the verse, and these big, lush piano chords come in, and there are a few interesting choices that Otakiechi makes with the chord progression, and so let's give that a listen. <laughs> So what's actually happening there? Now immediately, harmonically, things are a little bit weird because this progression looks backwards. Normally you'd have something like a A to a D to an E, then back to the A again, in what we call a 1-4-5 progression which is one of the most common progressions in rock and pop music, mainly because uh, the E is what we call a dominant function chord, which I could go into a lot of detail explaining, but basically means that uh, it's kind of unstable, and in order for it to feel resolved, it needs to come back down to the A. But instead, we start out on the E, and we go down to the D, and then go down to the A, in what is called a, and here's your big funny music theory word of the week, a plagal cadence. <laughs> a plagal cadence works because the four chord, this D in this case, uh, sounds a little unresolved, but isn't quite as directional as the E chord. So when you go from D down to A, it sounds resolved and it sounds nice, but it's not quite as uh, kind of final 
as going from the E to the A would be. And since we're really just starting with the song, uh, that makes sense why Otakiechi would choose these chords, because we're really just getting started with the song, and we don't want to give too much of a sense of like final resolution right at the beginning. But, I hear you saying, what about these chords, the C and the F? Well, those chords are a little bit harder to explain, but basically Otakiechi is borrowing those chords from A major's parallel key, a minor, which is a scale that sounds like this, and contains uh, many different chords, including that C major and that F major that we hear in this little turnaround. The C major and F major work well together also because they're the same distance apart as our D major and A major progression that we've been hearing throughout the whole song this far. So even though they sound a little bit tense because they're coming from a different key, it all resolves pretty well by the end, and hints towards the C major that will be used pretty heavily in the chorus. The chorus in this song contains no words, and instead uh, each of the three choruses that appear across this song are simply opportunities for uh, lead guitarist of Happy End, Suzuki Shigeru, to shred some sick, bluesy guitar solos. And while we won't be analyzing those today, um, we can still listen to this chorus and uh, admire that solo while we focus a bit more on the harmony and structure of what's going on. So uh, let's give it a listen. <laughs> So yeah, a uh, pretty quick little chorus, but there are three of them across the song, and uh, a great little solo from uh, Suzuki Shigeru, and a uh, great bass on the chorus. Uh, the bass really holds the song together across the whole thing, but I particularly love the bass line on the chorus. But harmonically, uh, we can notice a few things. Mainly, we still have that same D to A movement that we've had throughout the whole song so far. The only weird thing, however, is this C major that we get right here at the beginning of each uh, repeat of the chord progression. It replaces the E that we were having before, so it goes C major, D major, up to A major. Now we saw the C chord come in in the little turnaround before on the verse, and we said that it's uh, borrowed from A minor, uh, and whereas this song is in A major. This is a technique called mode mixture, or modal interchange, if you want to be fancy. And um, this is a fairly common chord to borrow in kind of rock music of the time, of the like late 60s and into the 70s. And I think that really works out well here as they use the turnaround earlier in the verse to kind of get our ears accustomed to this chord, give us a little a little taste of what's to come. And when it finally comes down on that C, first C chord at the beginning of the chorus, it sounds really kind of triumphant and uh, victorious, like we're overcoming something almost. Which is not necessarily a feeling that I'm super used to getting out of like a, uh, a kind of psychedelic guitar solo section, but I think it works really well here, and I think Otakiechi really does a lot with only changing one chord from the chord progression of the verse. And from there the song has another verse and another chorus, which then leads into this bridge section where the piano is swapped out for this kind of psychedelic phasing organ, and uh, we get some interesting vocal harmonies and uh, a really smooth bass line. Let's give this section a listen. So 
so yeah, there's a big shift in the sonic texture here with this uh, very bright organ playing and uh, the kind of spaciness of the vocals. But um, harmonically, we're doing about the same thing. We're still focusing on that relationship between the A chord and the D chord. However, uh, things end a little bit strangely. We then go up to an A over C sharp, which sounds like this, and is still an A major chord, but we've taken this A that was being played down here, and we've moved it up to here. So now the lowest note is this C sharp, which is why we write it as A over C sharp, because it's still an A chord, but now the lowest note is this C sharp. Now, I will note that this is the one chord that I'm a little bit iffy on. It is possible that they're playing something more like a like C sharp minor or maybe even C sharp major. Uh, it's a little hard to tell in the kind of psychedelic soundscape that's happening, but after giving it several listens, I think they're playing an A over C sharp. And that A over C sharp brightens the whole thing up a bit. It makes it go from this to this, and we're getting a little bit more uh, tense. And it sets us up to drop into this B major. B major is another chord that isn't in our scale, A major. Uh, the B chord that's in A major is B minor. But they play a B major here. And I think what's happening is they're using what's called a secondary dominant. Now secondary dominants can get kind of complicated, as can all of this stuff if you want to take it there. But basically what's going on here is in the same way that the E chord from earlier as we were talking about has dominant function, so it really wants to resolve down to the A chord, the B chord really wants to resolve to the E chord because if we were playing in the key of E major, B would be our dominant chord. And that sets us up for a return to the verse, which as you can see, the first chord of which is E. From there they have one more verse that then leads into a big long final chorus where uh, Suzuki Shigeru just shreds the day away all the way to a fade out that ends the song. So I hope you guys enjoyed this little look into what makes this song tick. I hope it wasn't too obtuse with all the music theory stuff. Let me know in the comments if uh, you liked this video or hated it or if I should do more. Um, I'm really interested by looking more into the nitty-gritty of individual songs rather than full albums, though I don't plan to stop doing album reviews at any point. Um, but this might be something I could do as a little break in the monotony every once in a while. Let me know what you think, and uh, I'll see you guys in a couple weeks for another review.